So, what we're going to be uh, describing to you today are things that came out of the research program and they're not at all what I set out to do. Uh, and I'll make uh, clear what uh, that means, what I mean by that in, in, in a moment. Uh, so, the questions uh, that we're now looking at is, uh, first of all, does there exist a plausible theory for decision making under uh, in risky environments? I mean, if the answer to that question is no, that is uh, something that's uh, quite troublesome in economics and all kinds of other disciplines. Um, what are the implications of calibration propositions for empirical ap uh, applications of theories of choice under risk? Certainly a matter of great interest to experimental economists, but also to people in finance, uh, other types of economists, and, and people in many other disciplines. And But then the question is, what are the implications of data from experiment, experiments? Because if these calibration propositions can't be shown to be based on patterns of small stakes risk aversion that are known to have empirical validity, then it might be an interesting philosophical exercise, but it's not clear why, at least uh, as an experimental economist would say, then I don't really care about it. Um, the, um, another question is, um, finite St. Petersburg games, in other words, St. Petersburg games that you can actually implement, um, and concavity calibration, how can they be used in consistency checks? So what, one of the things I want to start uh, getting into fairly quickly um, is if you do apply econometric studies uh, involving risk, you do experiments, you do things in lots of other ways, um, you may be using functional forms, for example, in your econometrics, that in fact probably have properties that create real problems for whether you really want to draw the conclusions that you might otherwise draw. Okay, the content I'm going to be talking about comes from three papers. One that uh, Yelsa Sidira and I published in Games and Economic Behavior 2006. Uh, the second one is a chapter, um, our chapter, in, in a book uh, that's uh, about to come out any day now that Glenn Harrison and I are, are co editing um, called Risk Aversion and Experiments. And the third one is the um, one uh, that it's currently under general review. And uh, you have uh, copies of the second and third papers listed. OK. I'm going to be talking about a class of, of decision theories that, for reasons that I hope to make even more clear than it might be by simply looking at their names, actually span um, all the different ways in which different theories represent risk attitudes uh, currently. That's why we selected them. So there are ones, obviously, expected value theory, you know, expected utility, prospect theory, rank penalty theory, the dual theory you may or may not have heard about before. I think it will become clear why we selected that one. And as we all know, you know, much literature during the last 25 years has been concerned with differences between these theories. In fact, uh, you might see a lot of that uh, literature has been concerned with uh, uh, a, a growing group of researchers that are essentially saying, uh, you know, if you economists or you standard economists, if you would just finally admit that you ought to give up expected utility theory and, and instead adopt prospect theory, the world would just be a better place. And I, I've never quite understood this. It almost takes on the element of kind of a, a holy war, especially if you're, as I was in many years, in an economics department in a business school where people in other disciplines uh, a lot of them firmly believe in prospect theory. Um, we're taking a very different approach. Rather than this long, huge literature looking at the differences between the theories, uh, we're going to focus on their common par paradoxical properties. Um, and then also on any consistency checks, both internal and external, that will arise if you use any of these theories in applied work. <coughs> okay, what are the two ways? And we look to, well, the first one is the classic question, St. Petersburg paradoxes. Uh, after all, what, in, with Daniel Bernoulli in 1738, <coughs> first raised questions about whether expected value theory was reasonable to use. In that sense, way back then, it was the um, precursor of von Braun and Morgenstern's work, at least in the part concerned, um, with later development by Arrow, Pratt, and so on, of uh, 
the respect to utility approach to uh, studying risk. The other thing is uh, concavity or convexity calibration. Uh, and this is where seemingly reasonable patterns of small stakes risk aversion imply rejections of wide stakes risks that are empir empirically implausible. In one case, we have a, a, an acceptance implication, in the other case, a rejection implication that just on its face seems unreasonable. So we're going to consider these as this sort of one a classic paradox, the other a recently uh, Paradox raised recently by originally by Matthew Raven uh, that has received a lot of attention uh, recently. Now, if you remember the original St. Petersburg paradox, perfectly straightforward. You have a game, plays two dollars to the end if the first hit appears on flip end. Um, probability the first hit appears on flip end is of course one half to the end. The expected bit value of the game is infinite. Well. What did Bernoulli do? He reported he asked a bunch of people if they'd be willing to play, how much they'd be willing to play this game, and after all, it has infinite expected value. And they, he reported what they said, pretty small numbers. Um, and as we all know, Bernoulli offered log utility um, as a solution to this. And in that sense, you can look at what Bernoulli offered as the precursor of, of uh, expected utility approach to this um, and you see the easy solution is W's initial wealth. Why just pay off the amount that someone would pay is given by this equation. It's uh, the solution to that. Um, and if initial wealth is 50K, $50,000, then the largest amount someone would pay is $16.56. So this is uh, uh, Bernoulli's solution to this question. But in fact, this is well known, it's been known for quite some time. Bernoulli didn't really provide an answer to this. Um, so uh, we don't need um, utility functions that have inverses, but it's easiest to see the result here. It's, again, something that's, uh, I think, well known. I, I want to make everyone is, um, with, us, with me on this. So suppose the utility function U does have an inverse, then instead of the prize on the flip N being $2 to the N, let it be U inverse, where U inverse is the inverse function of U. Uh, U inverse of $2 to the N, uh, then the expected utility of the generalized in Petersburg being named is still infinite. So uh, in this case, with his function being the log function, then what you pay uh, if the first head appears on flip N is not $2, it's E to the 2N, log of E to the 2N is 2N, St. Petersburg is still there. So Bernoulli's solution was no solution at all. Okay. Um, within the context of what? Expected utility theory what we would now recognize as expected utility theory. So he, his solution is not a solution at all. Now, what we do is say, well, OK, uh, you know, is this just a problem for expected utility theory? It's been viewed as just a, pro a, a problem for expected utility theory, I, I, I think, as far as I know it has. Uh, well, what we show is that these generalized St. Petersburg paradoxes can be constructed for all five of the theories, which are all the prominent theories. It's not confined to expected utility theory. That's proposition one in Yolt's uh, scenarios in my chapter in this uh, book uh, that I'm quoting. What, what it like. So this is, uh, if generalized St. Petersburg paradoxes are a problem, then it's a problem for all of the prominent decision theories, not just expected utility theory. All right. Well, now let's uh, let's uh, look at uh, some classic work. What are the, what are the seminal works of the expected utility approach? Where well, we know what they are? It's Arrow and Pratt, right? <laughs> they are the big guys there. Okay, um, and um, and then uh, an advanced textbook on this uh, is uh, Lafont's textbook. All right. Well, they were aware of the generalized Saint Petersburg paradox that I just explained. And so they saw that, that as a problem, obviously. They didn't want to have some theory that could be su subjected to the St. Petersburg paradox. After all, the Bernoulli's original purpose of offering log utility was to get around that problem. So um, the other thing, being theorists, of course, they define the theory on an unbounded domain. Why? Because they don't want a theory to have 
They're ambitious. They don't want a theory that just applies to some bad domain. They want it to sort of apply everywhere. But they were aware of the uh, St. Petersburg paradox. How did they fix it? They fixed it by assuming bounded utility. That's how they fixed it. If you have bounded utility, the St. Petersburg paradox can't come up because utilities simply become zero as the prices, the margin utilities, as the prices uh, get big. So that's how they fixed it. If you read, uh, if you read those uh, classic works, uh, um, it's uh, Arrow's, Arrow's essay. It's just stated as an assumption. Pratt's, you, you can find it there. It's, it's, it's there. Lafont just clearly states it. Now, this is a, this is a, this is a, a wonderful example uh, of no matter how, if, how brilliant someone may be, if it doesn't occur to them to ask the question, they can have a problem. If they knew they had the, the, Saint Peter's, the generalized St. Petersburg paradox. They knew how to solve it. Never occurred to them to ask the sort of question that comes up if you have started being concerned with concavity calibration. It occurred to us to ask the question because that's what we're working on. Okay. So they failed to ask this question. The second question is, if risky decision theory is defined on an unbounded domain and the utility money transformation function, a money payoff transformation function is bounded, which is what they assume, then is the implied risk aversion plausible? The answer is no. That's there in Proposition 2. It be also in my chapter. So, what does that tell you? Uh, well, here's an illustrative proof before I go on that. Uh, an illustrative proof, this is really, and this is why you, saw it, you, you see why they clearly it never occurred to them the answer to the question. I mean, we, we again, we don't need, we don't need um, uh, something as strong as the conditions we're using here, but it went out and get something really um, accessible. And of course, this is what we saw first. I mean, you know, obviously, Arrow and Pratt, if it occurred to them to answer this question, they, to ask this question, they would say, this. it's just simple. Uh, at least uh, when we use this regularity, the regularity is not really strong. Here's the proof of the special case. Normalize the utility function so the utility of zero payoff is zero, one standard normalization. Let u of z, where z is any prize, be less than or equal to n. Well, this is just the assumption that the utility function of the payoff function is bounded. That's all. It's bounded by the number n. For all real z, for all real prize of z. Now, define z tilde with the state u of z tilde equals 0.5n. Well, if the function u is continuous and monotonically increasing, z tilde has to exist. Then, well, then u of z tilde minus u of 0 equals m over 2, just by the, our definition here. u of g for a prize g of any size minus u of z tilde has to be less than equal to m over 2. Why? Coming from this bound and from how we define z tilde. Hence, the lottery, the expected tilde of the lottery, one half probability of getting the prize 0 or one half probability of getting the prize anything up to positive infinity is less than the u of z. That's totally. Implausible risk aversion in my book. Um, it's that simple. Now, um, for this example, uh, if you don't like me, you think there's something special about a price of zero, don't like that one, well then restate the proof, normalize the utility function. So u of some positive uh, prize a is zero, and then just complete this, do the same steps. So it's that simple um, that there's a problem in, in the way they, these classic development of the theory work. Um, and um, so, uh, but it's not just expected utility theory. <laughs> so uh, implausible theory of unbounded domain uh, in, in our, the in my uh, uh, chapter, we proved the, the following. For all five decision theories, again, all the prominent ones, if theory is defined on an unbounded domain, then it must be characterized by either the generalized St. Petersburg paradox or implausible risk aversion. Take your pick. You can have either one, but you've got one of the other. Um, so are all these theories implausible? I'd say yes, if they have to contain either a St. Petersburg paradox or implausible risk aversion. Uh, I'd say the answer is clearly less, they're implausible. If they're defined on the unbounded domain that's been used in the seminal works on theory. Yeah. 
this clarification. Can you just go back and convince me again of why I should believe this is Im implausible? You're saying that I'd rather have a 50% chance at an at a infinite prize than some finite uh, uh, thing for sure. I would say that this says you would prefer, you would prefer uh, I prefer the certainty of. That, that, that you prefer the certainty of a finite prize to a 0.5 probability of being zero for. I'm an atheist, so I have to take Z. Pardon? I'm an atheist, so I have to take Z. Pardon me? I am an atheist, so I have to take Z, pro Z tilde. Because you don't believe in it. Otherwise, I'm accepting Pascal's wager. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Anything screws up when you put it in infinities. The, um, the, uh, well, then it doesn't have to be infinity. You can be the big thing you want. But, um, yeah, that, that is a question of clarification. Because I would rephrase the question. I would worry about this. What this doesn't tell you is how big this is. Okay? So, th and, and that's what we're, that's what I'm going to get into in, in the, uh, the other paper gets into. Okay. That, that, okay. So I would say, uh, uh, what this says is, if you're going to do it this way, <coughs> and you're doing theory, so, and so you're not worried about is z tilde big or small, but rather you have you have this implication for either uh, th th that you will uh, there's some there's some finite amount that no matter how large you put the amount over here is, you're always going to take the certainty. You've got a problem in the theory. The question that the second paper is going to get into is going to be questions on non domains, which is where I'm going next for this. Um, uh, so that's why this is at the top of the screen. <laughs> that's what, a less polite way of saying, addressing some of the issues you're raising. So what? Um, I mean, uh, when, I mean, there are various responses to, to what, I, what I just went through. Um, and, and various ways one might say, eh, well, yeah, that seems to be, you know, for formally, formal development of theory, that's, there's clearly a problem there. But exactly what is the problem? And who is it a problem for based on what kind of work they're going to be doing? Um, and my natural way of looking at this since I'm always sort of switching between my theorist hat and my experimental economics hat, um, is to look at applications of theory and say, well, you know, so what? All applications of theory are, are on dominant domains. So why should an applied economist care, care about this? Maybe an applied economist shouldn't care about this at all. They say, well, you theorists need to go back and clean up your act, figure out some other way to solve these problems, or stop you know, thinking you can even do theory on an unbounded domain, just bound the domain. Uh, well, okay, fine. Uh, there's a so what question. So now let's ask a somewhat different question. Let's say, does the analysis we just looked at on an unbounded domain cause us to ask new questions about applications on bounded domains that we otherwise wouldn't ask? All right. Uh, so let's look at bounded domains for a while. Now, a bounded domain obviously solves the infinite expected value feature of the St. Petersburg game for expected value theory. Um, uh, Bernoulli never need, needed to talk about um, um, log utility. All he needed to stop was stop and think, wait a minute, no one can offer, in, uh, make a credible offer for indefinitely large prizes. So if the maximum uh, pay, for example, a maximum payment the supplier of the game can credibly offer to pay is $1.0737 billion, which is $2 to the 30th power, then the original St. Petersburg wins a game that pays two to the end if n is less than 30, otherwise $2 to the end. The expected value of that game is $31. And so Bernoulli never needed to introduce live utility. All he had to do was recognize that what he would if he were a good economist that no one can credibly offer uh, to supply a game that with infinite payouts or indefinitely large payouts. So um, if theorists didn't think they needed unbounded domains, there was really no problem to solve in the first place. So the question then is, does that say that the St. Petersburg game, Petersburg game 
is of no interest to unbounded domains? Uh, I'm going to say later that the answer to that question is no, it's of interest to unbounded domains. The St. Petersburg game as opposed to the St. Petersburg paradox. All right, well, um, bounded domain restricts the scale over which small stakes and um, risk aversion needs to be consistent with large stakes risk aversion in order for the theory to be plausible. Is the implied implausible risk aversion for large stakes also not a problem on bounded domains? This is the, the question of what is infinite, you know, infinity and z tilde. Okay, so that's, that, that's, that's one way to get that question. All right, well, let's look at commonly used parametric forms. Now, these parametric forms uh, were, uh, are widely used. They, of course, were looked at by Arrow and Pratt because they looked at uh, their uh, absolute and relative risk aversion measures. Um, and, um, the, and these are, are, are widely used by economists whenever we look, we're uh, teaching students, we're, we're tempted to look, to look at these two examples because they're simple parametric forms. Uh, and they're widely used in applied econometrics work. Uh, at least in economics and I think in other disciplines. And another one uh, is uh, reasonably widely used is the actual power. So let's look, let's look at those three functional forms. And, and you know, they're used all over the place currently. In fact, in the book that Glenn and I are edit co, co editing, uh, uh, people are using these two <laughs> <laughs> in different places. Um, and they're, they're, you know, the journals are bristling with like applications of this. What about? Well, let's look at care as an example. It's bounded. It's a bounded function. Um, in fact, if you look back, just notice that uh, this part of it is bounded by the number one. So it's obvious. It's bounded. Um, the question then is, with the value of lambda, and you, you know, if you do this kind of work, then the question is, with the value of lambda you've estimated or are using in examples, does Kara have implausible risk aversion on your bounded domain? If so, you better worry about that because you might be drawing a conclusion that in fact makes no sense. Uh, it, it, again, because it never occurred to you to ask other questions beyond what you're doing. Well, for example, with any uh, parameter value lambda greater than equal to 0.04, and there are an awful lot of estimates in the literature that's true, Kara implies that $20 is preferred to a 50 50 lottery that pays $0 for G for all positive values of G. Of course, if you're on an unbounded domain, then G could be positive infinity, or any big number that Eric will accept. Um, <laughs> He's a little, he wants a little god, not a big Okay, then set G equal to your upper bound on your domain of interest. Does your conclusion make any sense? You know, it, one needs to ask that question for this kind of work, and people, people you know, don't ask that, haven't been asked, it never occurred to them to ask that question. All right, what about uh, CRRA? It's unbounded on an unbounded domain, hence has the generalized St. Petersburg paradox on an unbounded domain. Um, you know, with the value of R, the risk aversion parameter you've estimated or using in your examples, the CRA pass consistency checks, which are what now? They're finite St. Petersburg games. Um, suppose, for example, your estimated parameter is 0.5. Do you really believe that expected utility theory with square root, square root uh, transformation represents your, the agent's risk preferences in your data sample? Well, if you think so, then your agents with that utility function would be willing to pay as much as dollars n plus one squared to play the St. Petersburg game constructed in the way listed here, pays four dollars if the first hit appears on flip n less than equal one, otherwise four dollars. Are the people in your sample risk preferences willing to do that? Um, so um, I asked uh, my co-editor Glenn, since he was applying some of this, all right, you're, you're applying CRA at, uh, utility, concluding this can describe the data. Then uh, you really believe that? Here's a St. Petersburg game. Use subjects from the same pool and see if they satisfy it. And if they don't, you might want to worry about that conclusion. So it suggests, at least for, um, at least for us experimental economists, um, a whole set of questions in, in this type of work that need to be addressed if the conclusion that um, these estimated forms uh, represent the subject's risk preferences, in fact, is the conclusion that has what? Consistency that's internal, internal to the subject pool. Forget about external validity beyond the subject pool. 
Um, what about Expo Power? Well, Expo Power contains CARA and CRA as only in special cases. Hence, it can have the problems of either. Okay? Not necessarily. It can have problems of either. As an example, so I just don't think I'm picking on other people. I'll take my uh, Consider that parameter estimates reported in this widely cited paper in the AER by Holt and Lowry. Uh, so Susan Lowry is one of my colleagues. They reported estimates of the two parameters, 0.029 and 0.269. Those parameters imply that $122 for sure is preferred, preferred to a 50-50 lottery that pays $22 or G for all positive values of G. Now again, if it remains infinite, then that's G can be positive infinity. Pick Eric's largest number. Is this plausible on their domain of interest? I don't know. Like most people doing this kind of work, they don't say what their domain of interest is. I don't know. Uh, the, largest, the largest amount of money in their experiments was, I think, up to about um, five or six hundred dollars. So, $120 prefers $50, pays $22 or $600, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, those are the sorts of, um, this is the sorts of, sort of guidance that one can So, what you see here is the image for work that's being done on finite domains, which is what all of applied work is on, of the analysis is done in the infinite. So we want to sort of pull the chain of the theorists, but then provide something uh, uh, useful to experimental economists as a sort of image of, 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 of the infinite domain uh, theory on, on finite, finite domains. OK. There's a bunch more in this file. I put this warning here. It's uh, from my, uh, also it's uh, the uh, acronym for my uh, new set of so. But the, uh, um, what I'd like to do now is switch to the other the file for the uh, other paper. Uh, which is how you talk. Is there a plausible theory for a decision under risk? Causes um, Rilza, Sidiri, uh, Boda Vote, and Otio Escuta. We needed the more co-authors here because we needed experiments uh, with, uh, could be run in various parts of the world for reasons that will be clear. So why do we need to be able to do that? Um, okay, what's in this paper? Well, first of all, I'm going to say um, the plausibility problem. I think I would say is shown to be fundamental. Um, and. Th and th what I mean by this is the, the previous calibration literature focuses only on the implausible implications that can follow from quantitative transformation of money fails as an expected utility theory. So th this work in this calibration literature was, was in this, excuse me, um, sh short uh, paper that appeared in Econometrica, a paper by Matthew Raven in 2000. And then there was um, a follow-up um, opinion piece by uh, Raven and, and uh, Dick Thaler in, in the, um, those anomalies that was uh, written, of course, to offend people. But the, the approach they took uh, was that, look, expected utility theory as applied to risk aversion just makes no sense. And it was presented as a wedge issue. That, you know, this ought to be the final coffin the final nail in the coffin of expected utility theory, and you all ought to finally admit that you ought to be using prospect theory. And, when I look, and, and so our first paper, the one on this, the GEB paper, I, I set out to write that um, because I knew the conclusion, as they stated, couldn't possibly be right, because the calibration theorem only applied to one expected utility model which is the expected utility of terminal wealth model. But the axioms of expected utility theory do not and cannot tell you what the prizes are. All the, all the early pioneers knew that. And what external economists usually use is the expected utility of income model. The axioms can't tell you what the prizes are. So what are the arguments? Is it terminal wealth? Is it income? Are, are they commodity vectors? What are they? 
That's a second order assumption. And so we set out to, to sort of straighten that out, and I thought my objective then was to actually save expected utility theory for what I thought was a, 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 a more of an attack. And what we're ended up doing now is providing out results that I think is, is, is much more destructive than, than, than Matthew's wildest dream when he set out to raise this issue. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe you won't get it. We'll see. Um, so uh, we introduced a new calibration proposition that shows how implausible implications can follow from model and risk diversion with transformation of probabilities. And then given that we have these corollaries, it essentially captures all the known ways to introduce risk aversion in all the known theories. So that's why I say it's more fundamental. So what do we do? We introduce dual calibrations. Uh, they're dual calibrations in the sense that they, they are uh, for theories that are dual to each other in a way that I will, that I will describe in, in a minute. That represent preferences how? All the known ways, through nonlinear transformation of probabilities, nonlinear transformation of chaos, or both types of transformations. That's Garmal, actually. But, you know, so what? So they're propositions. So if, if, if uh, the following supposition is, uh, if you accept the following supposition, then the next conclusions follow. And the suppositions are about patterns of small states risk aversion. What if real people don't have those patterns? Now I put my experimentalist hat on. I agree with that. In that sense. And so the other thing is we, we report the first experimental tests that are work in this area. And we also discussed some d experimental design issues, since they, those issues are especially severe for work in this area for reasons that I'll, that I'll describe. Okay, so, um, and, and we explicitly derive uh, from, the, from the data um, conclusions and we state um, propositions for um, all the big ones. So expected utility theory, the transforms payoffs, the dual theory of expected utility, the transforms probabilities, only. So wh what do you have here? The expected, ut expected utility theory has a particular form, right? Its functional is always linear in probabilities. It's linear in payoffs if and only if the agent is risk neutral. As a consequence of what? The independence axiom. The dual theory introduces a dual independence axiom which implies that the functional representing the preferences is always linear in payoffs, and it's linear in probabilities if and only if the agent is risk neutral. It's in that sense that they are dual with each other. Cumulative prospect theory uh, transform both, uh, and, and rank the other rank dependent theories uh, transform both payoffs and probabilities for risk averse agents. Okay. All right. So what's 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 the what's the uh, what's the theory? Well, proposition one identifies a pattern of small stakes risk aversion that implies implausible large stakes risk aversion with the dual theory, but has no calibration implication for expected utility theory. It has some other, the experiment has other testimony in case of the data. The proposition, this pattern of small stakes risk aversion has no, so since expected utility theory is the dual theory of the dual theory of expected utility theory, you see how, we, how one pattern applies to only the one way of transforming, uh, of introducing risk aversion. Well, you know what's in another one. Proposition two identifies a pattern that implies implausible large stakes risk aversion with expected utility theory, has no implication for the dual theory. Okay? So you see, what we're seeing here is that these patterns are, uh, have quite different implications. So they're different explanations, they're, they're different fundamental things going on, the problem is all the theories have these problems. Okay, what else do we do? Each, pro each proposition has a corollary that implies implausible risk aversion. Each proposition for rank dependent theory and cumulative prospect theory. So what you see here is that, um, is, uh, was it still coming through? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, It'll get your heartbeat anyhow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what, um, what we see here is that um, rather than being a, uh, these calibration issues being something that you know, should cause everyone to, to finally admit that expected utility theory should be replaced by prospect theory, actually either type of calibration issue 
Nails prospect theory, so it's, it, 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 it's expected from both directions uh, rather than being immune to this. Okay. Uh, experimental tests, I mean, uh, the, the, the literature is full of, 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 of people saying, oh, it's been established that. Um, Raymond has shown this, somebody else has shown that. In fact, there's not a single experiment out there that provides any data up to ours about, about this. There's no data whatsoever that supports these, uh, these calibration processes. Although, there, are, uh, we counted, I think, uh, five papers recently published in the APR that all of which say <laughs> subjects do the following. So far as we know, up to now, no subjects have been shown to do this. Now, um, uh, okay, data from the calibration experiments are also used to test uh, cumulative prospect theory with variable reference points, which is one way around this, and uh, expected value. Okay, what do these compositions look like? Um, well, here's what they look like. Uh, so here's the one on convexity. So this is the one for probability transformations. Uh, so let's denote this, uh, this sum here. Here's the proposition one. It says, if it's true, this is a three outcome lottery. So this means that you get the prize uh, C times X with probability i minus 1 divided by 2n. Uh, you get the um, prize x with probability 1 over n, and you get the prize 0 with the remaining probability, the sums to 1. If that's pre strictly preferred to the two outcome lottery that gives you the prize cx with probability 1 over 2n, or 0 with the remaining probability, that's, so they sum to 1. And this is true for all i from 1 to 2n minus 1, then according to the dual theory, z is preferred to this times k times 0.5 for all z. Okay, you say, how can I possibly understand that? Um, here's, what you, here's how you can see what's going on there. Um, here's, here's the way we're constructed. And this is, uh, this, is a, uh, um, this is an experimental design that's motivated <coughs> and reflects the content of that theoretical proposition we just looked at. Okay, see what's going on here. <coughs> And this is, these are, these, uh, so we ran, this is, this was run in, in Magdeburg, Germany, these, and we ran with these payoffs, these euros. But you see what's going on in this pattern here. Here we have a two outcome lottery, and in this row one, it pays zero with probability one over 10, 40 with probability nine over 10, and in the same row, what is the alternative? Notice that what's happened is that we take one over 10 probability of zero, subtract it and we throw it in to the probability of this middling payoff 10. We also take probability of 1 over 10 from this high outcome, reduce that to 8 over 10, and throw it into the middling that one outcome. So we're taking probabilities from the tails and putting them in the middle. But this, these, um, this is definitely not a mean preserving spread of this. If it were, we couldn't test apply the proposition. It's not a mean percent, but you see the way we're, and if you looked at, at every single row, that's exactly what's happened. So what we're, of course, these probabilities are varying as they would in a whole Lowry type experiment as we go down the table, but the relationship between the option A lottery and the option B lottery is the same. There's two over 10 here that's been taken from here and See the pattern? This is an example of what this proposition says, <laughs> which of course you've got a lot, unless you've got a lot of time to, to study it. Uh, okay, so that's, what that, that's an example of what it says. Okay, uh, well that's only for the dual theory, but what about, uh, what about the uh, cumulative prospect theory and uh, rank dependent theory? Well, suppose that the same condition star you know, this assumption that um, we're talking about here, which means what? Condition star simply means that uh, these three outcome lotteries are preferred to the two outcome lotteries. Suppose, it, we don't need something that strong, but suppose that the preference for this B over A holds in all, all nine rows here. That implies implausible risk aversion to the field theory. Uh, the Uh, corollary simply extends this um, same property to um, uh, 
uh, prospect theory and rank dependent theory, and then additional condition. Why? Because See this condition here, c greater than 2? That c greater than 2 is telling you the relative size that the, uh, uh, of this prize and this prize. It says, of course, that this prize is at least twice the size of that one. Which is all you need for the dual theory. Why? Because it's linear and house. But the other two theory, prospect theory and rank dependent theory, transform payoffs as well as probabilities. And of course, the question is, well, how much do they transform? So you see, the corollary then requires this restriction. This, instead of c greater than 2, it requires, so if, if you're talking about prospect theory, this is the value function. And it would say that we have something where the value function is such that the value of cx divided by the value of x is greater than 2. Obviously, if v is linear, then we simply get C greater than 2. Okay? So what's going on here? What are the implications of this? Yeah. Going back to where you said that you're experimenting with subjects that give it the A or B, and you're saying that if they choose what, if they choose B, that's implausible this conversion? According to the proposition, yeah. And but implausible is defined as I don't believe this, or this action. Okay. Well, that's what I'm going to show you next. Okay. Here's what implausible means. Um, <laughs> that's the next slide. Um, glad you asked. <laughs> um, here, uh, let's suppose that this N, remember it said that this preference holds um, for all I equals up to 2N minus 1. Let's suppose that your n is, let's take the extreme case, 500. Then um, the dual theory said, and, and we were looking at the, um, uh, we were looking at prizes there in that table, the ones we ended up using, uh, of uh, 40 euros and 10, and the other one's zero, of course. It would say that if that holds, then that someone would, uh, and, and we have our uh, five, the value of n in, in, in the process is 500. It would say that someone would prefer um, 100 euros for sure to a 50-50 bet um, of getting zero or um, something involving 10 to the power 242. That's what I mean by plausible risk aversion. <laughs> um, now, of course, if you say, well, if I want to bound my domain, then simply, you know, um, Substitute any number there. That's the biggest number you want to talk about, right? That's what I mean by that. Obviously, if you're not batting it, then this is that's impossible to find anybody's potential to it. But if you want to bound the domain, pick the top of your bound domain. You see the implication. That's what I mean. It, it has implications. It's utterly ridiculous. Um, that's what I mean by impossible risk aversion. Okay. Well, I mean, you get back to this and you say, well, wait a minute, though. What we see here, as this value of n increases, um, these implications become more and more spe you know, spectacular. But for smaller values of n, uh, they're not you know, so spectacular. I mean, this is $24,400, not something to the 10 to the power of 242. So as we increase n, you get more and more spectacular implications, and hence results that beyond the point is, is you know, they're so implausible that they're, they're, it's an absurd, utterly absurd prediction. Well, this gets at an experimental design issue. Um, a trade-off between power of the test and credibility of the test. Now I'm, now I'm switching gears. I'm saying, yeah, all right, well, you know, up to now I could be a philosopher, but I'm an experimental economist, and I want to know whether anyone actually has such these risk preferences that produce these problems. If no, then it's an interesting you know, result for, for us philosophers, but for us uh, empirical scientists, it's not. So here we get into a problem, uh, a trade off, and it's inherent in these types of experiments. Um, and, and that is that the, the um, uh, look at the power of the test 
Here's our CX, which was forty dollars, uh, forty euros in that example. Um, here's his probability. Here's the two outcome lottery. I actually just reversed it and did so, uh, and so on. Now, if n equals five hundred, that was in that last row. We got these just other incredibly spectacular implications. Then convexity calibration really bites. I'll say it bites, but um, what about credibility of running the experiment? Well, here's what you would need to do if you did that. Um, first of all, if you were to actually implement that as your design, then uh, the value of the subject would have the subject would have to make 1,000 decisions. After all, it was 2n and n was 500, and the probabilities in adjacent rows of Imagine their, their, one, their decision table with 1,000 rows to make decisions in. <laughs> and the probabilities in adjacent rows would differ by 0 0.001. Well, you know, no, any experimentalist, if you offer them, say, I'm going to run this experiment, there, you'd be met by you know, gales of laughter. Um, but, and so there's a problem. So uh, to get this spectacular power, you need to run the experiment would be ridiculous. Um, but you sure get power. So that's the trade-off here. We're going to see there's another, a different trade-off you get into once we get into the other type of experiment, which will be what? For the other proposition where we're transforming chaos, not probabilities. Um, so the one we ran was actually this one, because why? We wanted to have a relatively small number of choices. We wanted only nine choices, and we wanted the probabilities to differ by uh, 0.1. That's why we ran this one. Um, so yeah, so okay, so this is this is what we ran. All right. Um, now, what this um, this uh, and this experiment was run in uh, in Magdeburg, Germany, um, University of Magdeburg. Um, it supports uh, several tests. Use it from proposition one and quarterly when. Uh, we want to get the result as if you choose option B for all nine rows, but you actually don't need all nine in that table for several adjacent rows, then you have implausible large stakes risk conversion for the dual theory, rank dependent, cumulative prospect theory. And although you don't get any calibration implication from this, remember that was part of what I was, you do get, you can still have an implication from the theory, it's just not a calibration implication. EU implies always choose the same option. Expected value says always choose option A, so we can still get data we can use in the test. Here's the results. In this case, I'm going to give you, first of all, if I have time, I'll explain how we did um, statistical analysis of this data. This kind of data, you have to use some kind of unusual techniques. But what I do, first of all, is a very, very conservative report. I'm going to simply count the number. This is like saying you're doing, um, you have some data, and you're not going to do statistics or, or econometrics. You're going to say, I'm going to look at the point predictions. And I'm only going to count as a failure of the theory when it fits exactly some patterns. So this is a very, very conservative way of asking the data that the data supports this. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, if we have time later, I'll look at the, the, the applied error rate analysis. Of this. So first of all, 43% of our subjects made choices of, that just counting Im, imply, uh, so no margin, no error allowed, Im, imply implausible life stakes risk aversion. Uh, for these theories, for EU, 94% of the subjects made choices inconsistent with predictions. Uh, I'll, I'll always choose the same option. That's the prediction of EU here. And for EV, 93%. So we're getting, we're getting substantial support even by this very conservative way of looking at the data for empirical support for the calibration. It actually does empirically bite and also very high rates of falsification. For and, and you did check that they weren't just making math errors and calculating expected value. They understood what the payoffs would be. We didn't ask them to calculate expected value. No, but they could have. It could have been that they were choosing with expected value, but they suck at math. And they think that, a, that B has higher expected value for some, for some numbers. I, I'm not going to give them help. Uh, that was specific to one theory, in particular because we're not really much interested in the EV theory, right? No, but you didn't do like a questionnaire afterwards saying, what's the expected value of A, what's the expected value of B? We weren't interested okay. in that. Okay. In fact, we, weren't, we, we weren't even interested in testing that. We just said, when, we're, not, we're interested in calibration. And, what's, and then we just say, does the data have other things you can test? Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily reject EV, it rejects that they can do math. Possibly. Well, you could say in any theory, if you, if you think your subjects calculate things, you can say, Oh, it doesn't reject uh, 
uh, the dual theory or doesn't expect the utility theory because they really they really think about solving equations and they can't do them. Do you really think that people solve equations? No, uh, I, I'm, no, I'm no experimentalist, but I would have thought that just checking that they would have been able to answer a simple question like, is A likely to give you more money than B? Just something like that to check. Uh, no. If we had subjects that <laughs> could You're the guy that knows uh, we did do a lot of checks to make sure um, that we weren't getting pa uh, random patterns in the choices. We, we certainly checked for that. There's no reason, we, we certainly wouldn't have separated out that theory because it's essentially no interest to us. But we just doing this stuff because we get this. Yeah. Yeah, just a real quick question. You said in that uh, previous slide about 43% made choices that imply an implausible <coughs> uh, large scale risk aversion. And um, so do you, you have some line for determining what's plausible and what's implausible. Mm -hmm. And in the, yeah, all the examples you gave us, you just gave us extreme examples, and so we all shook our heads and said, yeah, that's implausible. But how do you, I mean, it seems at the end of the day, this is sort of a, a beauty contest as in terms of what we consider plausible or implausible. Did you have some dividing line? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, sure what be in, 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 the, in the slide. Um, you can answer at the end of your talk if you want to. I'm just yeah, let me let me come. Let me not get okay. this. Yeah, um, it, it was where we would have um, we needed to have a sufficient in a table. Well, I'm going on now. Here we needed to have a we needed to have the choices in a sufficient number of adjacent rows so that the calibration could bite to, to produce something where um, they, I believe the amount of risk was, was um, it, it, it varied by the experiment. Uh, so let, let's come back to that later. Yeah, if, I, if I try and this next, it's going to vary across experiments. And, and, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, good question. So you know, how badly does it have to bite for it to be considered impossible? Your first bullet point addresses three theories, DT, RD, and CP. Do you right. have any evidence distinguishing amongst those three? They're all the same implication. They'll differ, they'll differ, they'll differ in, in the other experiment, but not in this one. Why? Because this is all things for the transform probabilities. <coughs> they'll differ in some of the others. Um, okay. Well, what about concavity calibration as opposed to, what about transforming payoffs? Well, here's the uh, proposition two. Again, I'm sure you'll immediately, by glancing at it, know what it means. Uh, so it says, um, positive numbers A, B, and probability <coughs> zero one be given such that this is true. This simply says what? The bet has positive expected payoff. That's all that says. So um, obviously we're going to talk about risk aversion. We want to bet that positive expected payoff, um, and then it says the if it's true that the certain amount of payoff x plus a <coughs> is preferred to the lottery, where you get x plus b with probability p and x with probability one minus p, and this is, if this is true for all x on an interval, then uh, for almost all z from this, you get this preference. Okay, well, what in the world does that mean? How you, well, here's here's uh, an example of what uh, how you incorporate what's in that proposition into an experiment. This is the game. This is the one we actually ran in Calcutta. Uh, for reasons I'll make clear in a moment. So the option B is uh, 100, 1,000, varying up to 6,000. In this case, it's rupees uh, since we're in India. The option A is 0.5 probability of these two prizes. Now notice uh, that in each row, um, the certain uh, this low payoff is uh, 20 rupees less than the, the certain amount, and the high payoff is 30 rupees more than the certain amount. That is held constant as you go from row to row. Okay. Um, coral and the corollary. Now you know since this. It starts where we have, says the lottery has positive expected value. You know, once we go to the theory where we're transforming probabilities, we're going to need a somewhat different statement. Just as we did in, in, in the other proposition when we went to the corollary, we needed to bring in a value function. What do we need to bring in here? 
of probability transformation function. What is the corresponding condition? Um, here it is. Now it's, of course, that the transformed probability times b is greater than a. Okay? Obviously, if you're not transformed probabilities, then it's just p b greater than a. If you are, then the transformed probability, the transformation of probability p times b has to be greater than a. Then you get a similar statement. Uh, calibrations, well, you know, same sort of thing we're going to talk about. Here, it's a question of, since the assumption is that this holds over some certain amount of income varying between little m and big M, what are these? Okay. Well, uh, these calibrations are for the case where uh, 3,000 of 3,000 of, what, of whatever, you know, the monetary unit is 3,000 is preferred to 50-50 bet um, of getting uh, G of probability 0.5 or 1,000. Yeah, 3,000 is preferred to 50-50 bet, we're going to get G or 1,000 then of course g is going to vary depending on what? Depending on the width of the interval over which you're calibrating. Okay. Um, and here we get calibrations for all the different theories. And once again, of course, if you pick a big interval, um, you're going to get these spectacular results. If you pick a smaller interval, you can still get some quite implausible implications, but they're necessarily going to be less spectacular. Here we get into the experimental design issue, um, and it's uh, here it is. Trade-off between affordability and credibility. So let's suppose that these are dollars, affordability. Um, let's suppose that the choice is between uh, X plus $100 received for sure, or the bet the same amount x plus $210 with point, probability 0.5 or a payout of x. Now, remember, we need to do this over an interval of these x values. Um, let's suppose that x plus $100 is uniformly distributed between 900 and 350,000. Have you participant? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we took both these numbers actually because these, this, this figure in 2000 was a number you originally used uh, in, the, in, the, in the theoretical paper by Matthew Ravis. That's why you picked that figure. Suppose we did that. Then the expected payoff per subject is greater than $175,000. Expected cost of running an experiment with 30 subjects is greater than $5 million. Um, I, my budget can't afford that. Probably yours can't either. So uh, you say, well, you know, why use dollars? Why don't you use an exchange rate? <coughs> Suppose we use uh, one dollar uh, equals one, um, um, and a dollar equals ten thousand experimental dollars. Wow. Uh, now the thing about this calibration is it's dimension invariant. I mean, I'm, you may think I've been talking about dollars or euros, and, and my examples are that, but calibration is dimension invariant. It doesn't have anything to do with units of account. Thing is that the interval over which you're calibrating has to use the same dimensionality as is in the risk. That's the design problem. So suppose you use a, a, a 10,000 to 1 conversion ratio. That solves this problem. Uh, but uh, I mean, this is then it's affordable. If that's the ratio, then it doesn't cost you five million dollars. What does it cost you? 500. Yeah, we can afford that. But what about the credibility of the experiment then? Then the binary lotteries involve trivial financial risks since the maximum risk is 2.1 <coughs> cents. Okay? So that's, the, so that, and you can't escape it, right? It's, it's inescapable. So this is the slide that Glenn loves, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he loved it. And, and, and actually, when I presented this to Central Florida, and he saw that. And he said, in rupees, no, I didn't like much money at risk. And I said, just wait a minute. So here's, uh, 
is, uh, in fact, if you look at this, this is what we actually run. If you look at this, you say, wait a minute. What was the exchange rate of the rupee into the US dollar at this time? It was, it was about 42 to 1. You say, hey, Glenn, what about a risk? It's a dollar, right? Uh, in fact, Glenn noticed that. And I was ready for him. You're okay. Here's my reply. I said, Glenn, he's a mutual friend of the virus. I'm sorry, but it's okay. If you thought the Southerners were going to convert their payoffs into US dollars and travel to the United States to spend them, then the question you just asked me is a relevant question. If it's not, then any student of international economic development, international, and he is such a kind of, that was a lot of fun. But Glenn and I, we weren't such good friends for a while, we're good friends again. <laughs> <laughs> um, even commenting the book. So uh, this is a, so here's our choice alternatives. Uh, okay, uh, should you take these payoffs seriously? Well, we collected both income data and, we, and our own price survey data. Uh, well, there, uh, uh, Teo did. So, um, with subject incomes, uh, there were students at the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta, and their incomes, and we got um, uh, data on their incomes. Most of them, uh, virtually all of them, just had um, uh, scholarships. Their income from 1,200 to 15,000, uh, 1,500 rupees per month. Therefore, the highest payoff. Um, in our, the highest payoff, certain payoff was 6,000, and hence, you know, nearly the sizes of these uh, payoffs um, was equal to four or five months' salary. For most of us, four or five months' salary is, 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 is real money. Um, and uh, the size of the risk involved in the lotteries, uh, the difference between the high and low accounts was greater than or equal to a full day's pay. So the amount of risk here was not trivial for these subjects. Uh, in terms of our price survey, uh, we um, uh, the Teo did a survey. Uh, um, so here are some food items: poultry, fish, red meat, uh, public transport, uh, restaurant prices, and so on. Um, and for the uh, food items, we we converted them. There, these are in terms of rupees per per kilogram. We converted it to, into pounds, and then we used the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, food pyramid, uh, or what's the size of a serving. Um, and so the amounts of risks are, um, the amount of risk was equivalent to also uh, 15 servings of poultry, or one and a half to three moderate quality restaurant meals, or 14 bus tickets, and a bunch of other information. So, uh, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't trivial uh, for these subjects. Um, uh, but, okay, so, um, the Calcutta experiment supports uh, several several tests. Um, and if you choose option B for several rows and implausible risk aversion for EU, and this is for all three of the models that we explored in the first paper. So for the expected utility of terminal wealth, the expected utility of income, and a, a new EU model we introduced in that paper where it's the ex utility of initial wealth, comma, income. Uh, so uh, all three of them. So we're going, you know, we go after our own new model too. Um, okay, and uh, um, the, a, a version of um, prospect theory that's come back recently uh, where they're introducing variable reference points that uh, um, makes it, uh, it's another epicycle, makes prospect theory harder to test, but we, we, we get that too. Um, and uh, dual theory, then, in case case, always applies to choose the same option. EV always choose option A. Uh, again, one of the implications, 27% um, of our subjects made choices that uh, <coughs> imply implausible risk aversion, wide stakes risk aversion. For the dual theory and for cumulative prospect theory with variable reference points. And this was introduced, in fact, um, uh, Peter Wacker, wrote a, a working paper. He was, he's a, he's a, he's a friend of, a friend of Bill's and mine, and uh, we uh, interacted a, a lot with him uh, at the uh, uh, University of Amsterdam. But he, he, he's a, he really likes prospect theory. And, and so he, 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 but he's also a gentleman and a true scholar. So he hated what we were doing in that first paper, which was saying, Raven, your stuff just doesn't apply to respect to utility theory. There's only one model. He said he didn't like what he was doing, but he's also a very honest and personable guy. He was our best possible critic. 
And so he greatly improved the paper. And what he said is if you bring in variable reference points, then the calibrations we did in that first paper simply don't apply to plus 50. Um, but of course, they, it's not being irrelevant on the fact that we're not transforming probabilities. But it also, it has a testable implication. And with variable reference points, it says, you know those amounts x, those certainty amounts? It says, well, every time you change x, you adjust the reference point. And so every row of the table involves the same bet. And so you can't calibrate it. Aha. But you can test it, because it says always choose the same thing. Well, it produces a much higher failure rate than if you could calibrate it. So that version of prospect theory actually, in, in terms, does much worse. OK. With respect to value, 87% of the stuff is This is the kind of idea of what you're saying here. So basically, if they once out of the you know, nine or ten times made a different <coughs> choice. They, eight times they chose one thing, one time they chose something different, then this would say they behaved inconsistently. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. That ties into Eric's point about making this thing. I'm going to certainly get to the, to the error rate analysis of the data, at least uh, Yes? Okay. Okay. Um, there was one more experiment um, maybe I'll, I'll just say a little bit about because it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to talk about. Um, this is actually the first one we, that was run, um, and uh, also in, in Magdeburg by Bodo. Bodo. And, and um, in this case, we wanted to solve the problem of this inherent trade, this problem of this inherent trade off between affordability and credibility. Um, and we try to solve it in, in, in another way. And so um, there's something that's really unusual about Magdeburg. There's a casino very, very close to the university. And so we decided to run an experiment partly at the university and partly at the casino. Um, and uh, here's what we're doing. These are pay these payoffs are euros. Remember, we need to be able to calibrate over a really wide range, and you say, well, boy, you must have really done well when you moved to Georgia State. If you can pay, pay <laughs> people payoffs of 110,000 euros in your experiment individual subjects, uh, well, uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we wanted to do this, and furthermore, in this experiment, we wanted to make sure that we were using adult subjects and not students. So uh, the Magdeburg also has a, a, a um, uh, an adult education program, people from communities, it's in the business school, and, uh, and people come back and get uh, degrees. Okay. But um, how did we do this? What do I mean by a contingent euro? Well, here's the way we ran it. We ran this experiment, these are your choices, uh, and then um, the subjects were told the following. The choices you're making may be paid, uh, the, uh, the, the choices you make and the, 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 the uh, realization of, of, of any bets that you choose to pay, if, if play, if any, may or may not be paid in real euros. And they will be paid in real euros if a certain condition is satisfied that we're, that we're going to, it's written down here, I'm going to show you that sheet of paper that's here in front of you now later. The reason we didn't want them to give them the condition in advance is because it, it involved the casino, and we didn't want them to be thinking through to the casino rather than thinking about these choices. Um, and so here's what the condition was. At, at when they made all these choices, then three of the subjects were selected randomly in front of them by uh, drawing the balls from over the cage. And those three subjects then would go with the experimenter to the casino, and the experimenter going through a randomly ordered list of subjects would bet 92 euros on a roulette table. <laughs> if it paid, you'd roll it over and you'd bet it again. You'd bet it first on a number 19, then on a number 23. <laughs> if they both hit, you could pay these. Now, is that, were these payoffs really different than hypothetical payoffs? I don't claim they didn't necessarily work. But it occurred to us that this would be really a lot of fun to, to do and to talk about and write up. And you know, there are all kinds of people that publish just experiments with hypothetical payoffs, right? I mean, even Peter Walker does in Econometrica. So if they can do hypothetical payoffs, 
we can do something that you know might be perceived as real passive. It's not even so much fun. Uh, so that's the way we did this. Uh, results uh, results look uh, pretty much the same. I mean, we, again, we can we can uh, we can uh, same proposition two and corollary two. We can we, we can test all of this. Um, here's what the data look like. Forty-eight percent of the subjects made choices that imply a plausible for EU, for DT, and, and, and uh, uh, prospect theory, variable reference points, 57% of the subjects uh, made choices inconsistent with the theory, and for e, for EV, it's uh, 50%. Okay, uh, then, um, so far, we've been, uh, been talking about results that are, that, that, that are really conservative way of testing things. Remember, I'm looking for patterns that exactly satisfy a condition. You say, well, that's we don't usually test things that way. We allow some slop, right? We have these error terms uh, that are occasionally in the underlying theory, but usually not. So it raises the usual question where those error terms come from. But, but uh, OK, here's, here's the way we approach this. Those, we used an approach that Harless and Kammerer, uh, I believe, first used in an econometric paper involving the error, error rate models. And so here's, here's the bare bones of how it works. We have two relevant categories of choice. A, choose option A, and B star, which is choose option B, or indifference. Why? Because all of those, these theoretical comparisons involve weak preference. That's why. So for the, uh, apply the propositions, you aggregate indifference with B, because that's the way the direction of the weak preference goes. Um, and uh, we use the constant error rate model, which works as follows. Um, if, if B star is preferred to A, then the probability that you choose B star is 1 minus the error rate. The probability that you choose A is the error rate. So this is a, a you know, where do you get error terms in any model? Where do they come from? They're just introduced at the end. Uh, this is a way of introducing an, uh, an error term into data of this type. What, are the data, what do I mean by data of this type? It's where you're looking for patterns of choices. Okay? Um, and of course, a similar thing for, for if you probability uh, if you choose A. Okay, what do you do? You, have, you estimate the likelihood of choice patterns that can be calibrated uh, and choice patterns that cannot be calibrated. For example, if a subject uh, prefers, in, in, in the first experiment, we had nine choice, nine rows. That was the one in, in uh, probability transformations. The subject pr who prefers uh, all B stars might nevertheless, if there's error, choose something else, say a couple of A's in here. Then the error rate model said that that's a probability. If this is the true preference, you'll, this will occur with probability what? Well, these aren't errors. Those are, so the probability is 1 minus error rate squared error rate squared, one of error is great to the fifth. Okay, so this is the way we did, uh, one of the ways, we also did some other things, some, some uh, analyses, some probit analyses, and so on and so forth. But this is uh, what we're doing for um, most of these tests. And so you, you, you find likelihood function, you estimate the error rate model that, that fits best, and, and then um, apply that. And if you look at some of these things I, I, I was describing, uh, the sort of most central things, what, um, when we looked at the um, uh, convexity calibration, the probability transformation calibration in Magdeburg, and I reported that 43% of the subjects satisfied the, 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 the condition. Um, if you require, you just count exact fits. If you do this error rate analysis, your point estimate of the proportion that satisfies it is uh, 86%. Here's the 90% confidence bound. Um, there's a wide likelihood. Um, so you're getting, you're getting a lot of significance here. The uh, Calcutta concavity calibration, just counting, I gave the 27%. The point estimate is about 40%. 90% confidence balance is 20 to 60. This other central result about where you look at the uh, cumulative prospect theory and the version of the reference points can be introduced to try and say, we have a version of theory that's immune to all this calibration stuff. 
the payoff transformation calibration stuff, there's no way that it's not equally subject to the probability transformation stuff. It only applies to one of the one of the experiments and one of the propositions. If you look at that, then um, and I reported that 77% switch at least once and violate the reference point, variable reference point model of this. You do a log value test, it simply rejects. And you know what it does? Uh, the, it re, the log likelihood test rejects the, and it's really interesting, it rejects the variable reference point version of prospect theory, which is a way to introduce a, yet another epicycle in the theory and make it harder to refute. It rejects it in favor of the original version with a fixed reference point of zero, which I find kind of a delightful result. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, and the other way is, you know, we did some other stuff. We, we did some, uh, we did some probit regression analysis of all these things about whether you switch or not and so on. And this is the one that would apply to, uh, to uh, the, uh, that prediction. Okay. In, that, in the um, likelihood functions you're estimating, what, do you, what is your parameter you're estimating there, E? The error rate. E, the error rate. The error rate. Okay, and, so, and, that's, and that's, the error rate is 0.86 or 0.14. When you get that, is that error rate analysis? Estimate? No, no, uh, the paper reports the estimated error rates. This is the proportion, this corresponds to that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. This, so, so this is very, very conservative. You just kind of exactly yeah, 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 things yeah, don't yeah. fit the point predictions. Yeah. This, it would have been better to write as, as 86%, and, and this is, 39.7% that corresponds to that. The error rates are, 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 are in here. These are the, so these are, these are the, this is, this says, if you allow an error into this, you're, you're getting patterns. 86% of the patterns do not differ significantly from ones that imply that the calibration bites. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are the 90% confidence bounds on that, on that point estimate. Uh, and the error rates are all reported in the paper and they're not here. They're, they're reported piece, you know, mm. test by test. Okay, uh, so what do we think we know about this? Well, we say that um, you know all four prominent theories of decision and the risk um, are subject to calibration critique, um, and the experiment data provides support for the risk patterns underlying the calibrations. Now. Since this is the first empirical work, this is the first, even so, so much noise has been made in journals about calibration. These are the first experiments to test this, and, and we would be, we would definitely say, I mean, you know, a, a lot more testing to be, to, to be done of this because we've got, uh, you know, sample sizes of 30 and 30 and 45 and subjects and so on. Um, but. Uh, Today, the available evidence supports that this stuff fights, and, and so uh, um, it's just, usually when I'm doing experimental economics and theory, I, I, uh, when I find uh, the data patterns are saying that the theory has problems, then I'm delighted because then the, the real fun starts, I put my theorist hat back on and I go down and say, okay, now how can I change the theory? Do I introduce risk aversion and the bidding theory? One thing I did for a long time, do I, do I, do I introduce, uh, do I take neoclassical homo economicus preferences and extend them to include reciprocity in, in a way that preserves the essence of neoclassical um, choice or demand theory? Um, in this case, believe me, if I had a clue <laughs> about what to do about this, I'd already be working on it. Uh, and I don't know what to do with this. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, other tests and um, other people run experiments, you know, pick apart our, if they can, the, 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 the proposition, pick, you know, pick apart the, if, if this sort of, uh, what this seems to point to, if it stands up, I, I don't know where, where we go for theories of decision under risk mix. I, I, I don't know. The, the patterns of what we're observing don't do what they usually do in other areas I've worked, where the patterns in the data suggest what you want to do with the theory. And in this case, they don't, as far as I, I at least I don't see it. But we're actually, we're at 4.30, mm -hmm. and um, I think we have done a remarkably good job 
of uh, not asking questions, which is usually That's very hard for this group. So uh, why don't we uh, join me in thanking our speaker and ourselves. <laughs> Lot of us do have questions, and so you can hang around and ask uh, Jim, and we'll be bringing one to the staff club afterwards. And, and, and Eric is here, so I guess I'll just keep talking to you. Slow, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go.